Um, good evening, everyone. It's a real honor to be in Ohio, and I want to thank Judge Harper and um, Miss Be Beatrice Jackson for having me here, and of course, thank all of you for coming out tonight. I'm very glad to have this opportunity and all of the opportunities that have been granted to me by the people of this country to tell you about my independent campaign for President of the United States how it's going and how it must continue to grow and to talk about how it is that we need to make a stand for democracy in 1988. Uh, this Monday the Supreme Court of the United States voted to reconsider the rights of minorities to sue private parties for racial discrimination. The question that the highest judges in America are asking is was the civil rights law passed by Congress more than a hundred years ago intended to bar racial discrimination by private schools, employers, and others as a 1976 Supreme Court decision ruled. If this present court um, decides that the original framers of the anti-discrimination law did not mean to go so far, which legal experts say it's likely to decide, it would be the first time in modern history that the Supreme Court has overturned a major precedent expanding the rights of racial minorities. Three of the five justices who voted to reconsider the century-old civil rights legislation are Reagan appointees. All of them were appointed to the court with the approval of Democratic senators. This very serious encroachment comes at a time in our country when the political environment is deeply divided, where conservative forces on the one hand are seeking to impose more severe limits on human, civil, and democratic rights, and where on the other hand, millions of Americans are pulling the lever for a black working class candidate who is openly pro-poor, pro-woman, pro-labor, and pro-gay. The country is deeply polarized, and in the face of this polarization, there is a growing demand for many, many people that political debate, political dialogue, and political choices be expanded so that the American people can determine the future course of our nation. Indeed, I believe that the most critical issue before the American people today is the fact that public policy, the policy that should represent us, is controlled and dictated by a two-party political monopoly which is accountable only to the very rich. A political monopoly which has disenfranchised the electorate. A political monopoly which has rendered, rendered majority views inconsequential. So my independent campaign for president is about democracy and fairness. It is about enacting the inclusionary rainbow social vision, which I share with Reverend Jesse Jackson and the millions of people who have voted for him. That vision is not, in my opinion, acceptable to the two major parties in this country. The abuse of democracy that I'm talking about was vividly demonstrated last week in New York State where the Democratic Party hierarchy, the Democratic Party machine, decided to stop Jackson. And we need to look closely at how that happened. In order for Reverend Jackson to have won New York State, he would have had to win New York City by a landslide. In steps New York City Mayor Ed Koch. Ed Koch, who some people attempt to write off as a buffoon, understandably, but he is not, and he was not speaking as a buffoon, nor was Ed Koch speaking as a leader or spokesperson for Jews in New York, as the Democratic Party would like for us to think. Ed Koch, who thinks, speaks, and acts, and runs like a Democrat, who I, by the way, ran against in 1985, is a leading Democrat. He's a leader in the Democratic Party hierarchy, and it is he who helped to prevent a Jackson victory in that very crucial state by stirring up the fears and tensions that already divide black and Jewish New Yorkers. The headlines of the city's daily newspapers, co-conspirators in the disunity campaign, mounted to challenge the inclusive rainbow social vision that has attracted millions of voters across the country to the Jackson candidacy, screamed Koch's warning that Jews would be, quote, crazy to vote for Reverend Jackson, end of quote. Koch's endorsement of Gore, whose position on Israel is to the right of the Reagan administration, not to mention most American Jews, was phony. It was a ploy. 
Koch used the Gore endorsement as a platform from which to attack Jesse as an anti-Semite and a radical, while Michael Dukakis, the real beneficiary of the anti-Jackson drive, stayed safely above it all. After all, Ed Koch had not endorsed him. White folks might have been put off by the form of Koch's savage attack, but many of them were still scared. So they voted for Dukakis to stop Jesse. The divide and conquer strat tactic worked, unfortunately. Dukakis, um, the technocrat, suddenly transformed into the hero of the day, came off smelling like a rose. Jesse, by the six o'clock news, was already being dismissed as someone who had fought the good fight and lost. Meanwhile, Paul Kirk, chairman of the Democratic National Committee, hypocritically, after the damage had been done, repudiated Ed Koch, acting as if he did not know the mayor by name. As for Koch himself, he had already called Dukakis and offered his services. I think we need to really understand who attacked Jackson in that city, who's responsible for the fact that the campaign in New York State was primarily a campaign that was organized around racial divisions and that that's a tactic and strategy used very often, unfortunately, by the Democratic Party. So this farce, in fact, this tragedy, highlighted the irreconcilable differences between Reverend Jackson's political appeal and the way that the Democratic Party does politics. The Democratic Party is structured and run as a racial and ethnic coalition, which is easily manipulated along racial and ethnic lines whenever the party bigwigs deem it necessary. But Reverend Jackson's message is a working class message, a working class politic that unites people of many races and many ethnic backgrounds around a common class vision. It is profoundly opposed to the interests of white corporate America, which ultimately controls the Democratic Party, not to mention the Republicans. The Rainbow Movement, which is our movement, it's a movement that belongs to the people of this country, is in its very essence righteously resist the divisiveness that is the stock and trade of Democratic Party politics. That is why the rainbow must go independent. It does not fit into Democratic Party structures or philosophy. Like many of you, I have been a, and continue to be, a strong supporter of Reverend Jackson's Democratic primary bid. From the beginning of my campaign, I have made it plain that if Jesse became the party's nominee, I would immediately stop running and campaign for his election. I also made plain that I did not think the Democratic Party leadership would allow Jesse to be nominated. If Jesse does not receive the nomination, I believe we must, and I believe that we have to, take the necessary steps to ensure the enactment into public policy of the programs and principles for which Reverend Jackson stands. These principles are many, and they are principles uh, of which we can be very, very proud the slashing of the military expenditures, a national health service, an end to the subsidizing of apartheid, support for lesbian and gay rights, housing for the homeless, job training for all our people who need jobs. It's very, very simple. The message that I'm taking out across this country is that a vote for me is a vote for those programs and principles, and a vote for the Democratic Party is not. And if increasing the chances that the Democrats will lose the elections means increasing our chances of affecting those programs and principles. I am prepared to cause the Democratic Party the election. I actually want to emphasize that point. People say, suppose your running does for office, does um, cause the Democratic Party to lose the White House and give us four years of Bush. Is all of that worth four years of Bush. So my reply is that while absolutely nothing is worth four years with Bush, our lives, our families, our communities, and our empowerment must be worth fighting for. We must be prepared to cost the Democrats the election this year and ev every and any political office from dog catcher to president of the United States if they are not willing to give us what we so desperately need. So I'm here tonight to ask all of you to come down this road, this independent road, with me.
for it is when we the people withhold our support if we are not supported and only then that we can seriously talk about becoming empowered either the democrats will cease their love affair with the republicans and embrace the people of this country the vast majority of the american people in which case we will have salvaged the democratic party as a vehicle for progressive change or they will openly abandon us in which case we will have a black-led multiracial independent party ready and set to go and to grow now i know that many of you are democrats i am a registered democrat myself and some of my best friends are democrats <laughs> but i think we have to come face to face with the hard cold fact that this party the democratic party has failed us and jesse jackson may not be able to say so in so many words but his campaign is saying so loud and clear jesse may have promised paul kirk the democratic party chairman that come what may he would remain loyal to the democratic party i have no doubt that mr kirk and other party bigwigs put a great deal of pressure on jesse jackson to make such a promise but i have never sworn a loyalty oath to the democratic party and neither have our people millions of whom have voted for jesse's platform a platform that the democratic party stands in direct opposition to we cannot afford to put the democrats first the time has come for us the people of this country to put democracy to put our people to put our communities our families and our children first reverend jackson is running for the democratic party and but he does not come out of that party. He was not made by the party. He doesn't owe anything to it, and neither do we. In the last 30 years, it has been the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the gay rights movement, the American Indian movement, the Chicano movement, the environmentalist movement, and the peace movement that opposed every inch of the way by the two-party system has won some fragile games for the people of this country. The Democratic Party's role has been to try to co-opt these movements and then to take credit for what it was forced to yield to them. The anti-apartheid movement is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. That there is any support from Congress or others in the political establishment for that movement is a result of people at the grassroots insisting for decades in word and in action that there can be no compromise with apartheid. An end to, an American, to American support for apartheid was a major demand of the black and white student movement of the 60s. But you'd never know that if you listen to the whole spectrum of Democratic Party politicians who act like apartheid became a problem, problem when Ronald Reagan came into being. Now you have every Johnny come lately, do nothing Democrat, talking like they've been anti-apartheid since the day they were born. But that's a lie. When Michael Dukakis, for example, says that apartheid is repugnant, he sang it because Jesse Jackson made him say it. And Jesse Jackson says it because he is giving expression to the grassroots struggle against apartheid. Jesse is ours, not theirs. So Jesse Jackson does not belong to the Democrats, but true to their nature, now that he's got something they want, which is the support of a significant sector of the American electorate. The party leadership are praising what he's done for the party, smugly confident that he cannot win the nomination and that his base having nowhere else to go is their captive. They're ready to turn Jesse into a monument as they did Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. With Jesse, they hope, they hope <laughs> safely out of the way and the rainbow, they assume, in their pockets the Democrats are turning their attention to what the media call the swing vote, moderate white voters. The question the Democrats are trying to answer now is how to pull white moderates behind a ticket headed by technocrat turned hero Dukakis, since those voters do have somewhere else to go and they've gone that route many, many times. Namely, they've deserted the Democratic Party when it's not responded to them to vote in the Republican Party. Well, this time around, so do we have some place to go who have a more progressive and de decent social vision. And we are in a position to teach the Democratic Party a lesson that it will never, ever forget. We are in a position to exercise the power of the people in this country. The rainbow is in a position to flex 
some independent muscle. I want to speak for a minute here about what it means specifically and concretely to exercise political power. As I've traveled across this country, I have spoken with many community leaders whose social service programs, their health clinics, and recreational centers are government funded, as is usual at election time. The Democratic Party is trying to scare everyone with their old lesser of two evil stories. Folks are now being told that their best chance of maintaining or adding to their existing funds is to vote for a Democrat in November. That way, they are to spend more time in the community. There's one problem, however, with that logic. It's been proven completely false. You see, the Democrats over the past 20 years have been considerably less successful than we need them to be in pressuring the Republicans. Spending cuts have been bipartisan. Indeed, we've had a Democratic Party-controlled House forever and a Democratic Party-controlled Senate for the last two years, yet hospitals and youth services and bilingual education programs and the like have been sharply cut back. We need to remind ourselves that Democrat Walter Mondale based his whole campaign on the need to, quote, balance the budget. <laughs> no, the way for community leaders and people in the communities to protect their programs is by joining the independent movement. My plan for 1988 is called Two Roads Are Better Than One, and it entails supporting Reverend Jackson in his bid for the Democratic Party nomination, supporting him unconditionally, militantly, all the way through the Atlanta nominating convention. But if the party's exclusionary racism and their anti-progressivism ultimately mean that he is not nominated, I am ready to run as an independent um, who stands for the inclusionary social vision of the rainbow. My independent candidacy guarantees that the progressive movement for peace and social justice, which is emerging in America once again, will not be given away to the Democratic Party as it was in the 1930s and as it was again in the 1960s. You see, since 1932, the Democratic Party has relied on one very important fact of political life, namely that come what may, the black vote and the progressive white vote belong to that party no matter what they do. An independent rainbow candidacy, on the other hand, ensures that black people, together with other rainbow constituencies, women, Native Americans, Chicanos, gays, peace activists, workers, and environmentalists, can withhold our support from the Democratic Party if we do not get a platform and a ticket to our liking. Our capacity to exert leverage on the Democrats is key. The party bosses are well aware that they need the Jackson vote to win in November. If even a small portion of his supporters desert the party, there is a good chance that the Democrats will lose the election. If Jesse is not the nominee, I believe we must go independent, even if that means costing the Democratic Party the White House. If that were to happen, the Democrats would be more than willing to embrace our social, social agenda. They'd be forced to. Our independent participation in the 1988 election can make a real difference in how politics gets done in America. We have the capacity to redirect the course of public policy in this country into the 1990s and beyond. In July, I'll be outside that convention um, in Atlanta along with 10,000 supporters of the two roads option as a reminder to the Democratic Party that the Fulani factor is a present danger. And we don't need tens of millions of votes to accomplish this. A mere two to three percent in the general election will be enough to change the entire landscape of American politics overnight. So much so that perhaps Jesse Jackson could run for president in 1992 as an independent and win the White House. So the dissatisfaction of the American people with the current political system is monumental. 50% of the people in this country did not vote in 1984 for president of the United States, and I'm talking about 50% of the eligible voters. 70 to 90% of the people don't vote in state and local elections. And our leaders, all kinds of leaders, try to convince us that the reason for this is because people are apathetic. But people in this country 
are neither apathetic nor stupid. If we saw a relationship between pulling that lever and changing the homelessness, changing the crisis that many, many elderly people are facing, changing the failing health care system in this country, finding a cure for cancer, for AIDS, and implementing cures that we already have um, in existence, uh, and, and using them with young people who are dying in the streets and all over from many, many different things. If there was seen a relationship between the two, then people would vote. They would flood the voting booth, and they would vote for anything from dog catcher to president of the United States. But think about it, we voted, and we voted many, many times based on a host of promises. We've been some of the most loyal supporters of that Democratic Party, and things in our lives have not changed dramatically, at least without getting worse. So we, the people of this country, are dissatisfied, and we can do something about that dissatisfaction. One of the things that we can do is to go independent. We need to get this message out. It must be heard. My independent voice has to reach all the voters of this country. One of the things that it takes to do that is money, and I'm very, very glad to be here today. Um, I'm asking everyone here to make a donation. I used to feel very, very uh, squeamish and uncomfortable about asking people for money until I realized that Pat Robertson had raised $4 million for a social vision that I'm frightened of, <laughs> that I don't want anything to do with. So I realized that we who believe in a more progressive social vision have to be willing to put our money where our social vision lies. So sponsors are giving between 50 and the, la the uh, legal matchable limit of $250. We have a stamp because if FEC is very particular about how the checks are made out and we'll help you do that. We'll stamp them for you. Also, we're looking for people to become matching funds raisers. Um, the way that we've taken out the campaign all across the nation is by virtue of knocking on the door raising donations through checks and telling people that there is an African-American woman independent running for president of these United States, mounting a fight for fair elections and democracy. And people say, yeah, I believe in that. I'll give you a check. And that's led to over 35,000 donors from all walks of life, uh, Republicans, Democrats, independents, people of this country saying we need to have more of a choice. Um, I guess I want to end by saying that come November of 88, there will be one progressive, pro-woman, and pro-people candidate for president of these United States on the ballot in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. It will either be Jesse Lewis Jackson having staged the biggest upset in the history of the Democratic Party, or it will be me, Dr. Lenora Fulani, the African-American independent supporter of Jesse Jackson, not beholden to the corporate-controlled, nuclear weapons-obsessed political establishment, and accountable only to you, the people of this country. In 1988, we the people need to take a stand for democracy. We owe it to ourselves to be independent. And I invite you to join me in this fight for fairness and for power for our people, for all of our people. Thank you. Very, very much. So, questions. First of all, if there is, first, it's highly unlikely, or it's not clear what the Democrats are doing. I think, um, you know, we've seen all these debates with the hotshots in that party, and it's pretty clear that they don't want to give Jesse anything. <laughs> Um, but if, in, and in fact, if he was asked, I have no idea what he would say, obviously. But if there was a Dukakis Jackson ticket, one of the things we have to realize is that Jesse would then be subjugating what he believes in to a Michael Dukakis. And in spite of the fact that, that Dukakis has supposedly performed some miracle in the state of Massachusetts, the people of Massachusetts don't particularly know that much about it. That miracle was performed in behalf of big business. So number one, number one, number two, um, we would be voting not then for Jackson and his platform, we'd be voting for Michael Dukakis. The vice presidential slot has never been a slot through which people emerge in leadership and go on for the most part to become president of the United States. It would be like putting Jesse on the shelf for eight more years. And given how the Democratic Party feels about Jesse Jackson, they'd put him on a boat and send him someplace. We might not see him for eight more years. Um, that's if that ticket won. If the ticket lost, 
if Dukakis, a Dukakis-Jackson ticket loss, then Jesse, of course, would be blamed for the loss. And um, I think it would set back the leadership and the fight for leadership of the African-American people um, many, 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 many years. So if Jesse gets the presidential nomination for which he is running, then I will passionately, as I have been, um, continue to support him and I will stop running. But I am settling for nothing less, not for the vice president, nomination, not for him to be the czar of drugs. This is this racist suggestion, again, made by Mayor Ed Koch. Uh, you can always count on him to come up with something like that. But we have built that campaign, and the movements that are expressing themselves through him have struggled for many, many years, and we can't settle for a symbolic position. We want some power. Other questions? Yes, I really appreciate your dedication. And but there was something that was disturbing me very much and this was in Sunday Plain Dealer about schools in Ohio. I don't know if it happened in other states or cities or not. Uh, about the preparatory schools that are just ripping uh, excessively low income people off mm -hmm. for their money and they're encouraging them encouraging them to attend these schools and I also understand that they have even had a uh, test they have that they're being given that they are not even qualified for they are uh, some families they owe so many thousands of dollars you know these schools are not even credible and what they're doing is with uh, they have financial aid, mm -hmm. you know, they say if you're qualified. Now, I don't know what the qualification is if you qualify. Maybe they mean low income. And um, these people have, um, I don't know how the government is getting away with this, the federal government, you know, to say what, well, yes, well, you do this. And then they convince these people to uh, take out a um, some kind of loan, mm -hmm. but, you know, and then of course they're going to have to pay this back, mm -hmm. and and I think that it's really wrong, and and also in the newspaper that we signed up, uh, and um, employers when they hear that they have been accredited from certain schools which they would not mention, mm -hmm. you know, they say, oh no, we hear about this and. I mean, we know about these hmm. schools, and we will not even accept these people as applicants. Mm -hmm. I don't. So, what can be done about that? Mm -hmm. You know, this, this is awful. Mm -hmm. I don't know um, about the particularities of this situation, but I think there are many situations. The proper, uh, what do you call these schools that you, you you see in the you know you look at the paper mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. A technical electronic school. Right. Well, this kind of thing happens all over the country because on the one hand, um, people who have little money, like all kinds of people in this country, want a decent education for their children. They want a future. And people, um, very rightfully so, are searching for some way to do that. However, as long as education remains in the United States of America a um, profiteering, um, something for profit, then it's very, very difficult to guide young people oftentimes to get the kind of education that they should get. I mean, one of the reasons why families are turning to uh, these kinds of situations is because of the failure of public education. The public educational system in this country is unresponsive, um, and I think that they're, in many ways, deliberately unresponsive. I don't blame the teachers in those situations. I, for the most part, blame a public educational system that does not get the kind of monies that it needs again from the federal government because as hard as it might seem and as hard as it might be to hear this education for young people in the United States of America is not a priority because if it was just like we're able to send people to the moon and do many 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 different kinds of things we would be producing through these schools young folks creative folks uh, young people who could do all kinds of things so I think what we have to do is to fight to make sure that we the people 
prioritize what happens in this country, whether we're talking about health care, whether we're talking about education, whether we're talking about jobs and jobs tr job training. And when we're prioritizing those things, we'll prioritize them in behalf of us, not in behalf of um, what makes the people who run those businesses wealthier. So I think there are just numerous examples in which people, and in particular, people who don't have a lot get ripped off. <laughs> That's oftentimes the name of the game. And if we want to change that, then we have to do it by virtue of building a political movement so that we have a voice and we make decisions, no matter what level it is, no matter whether we're talking about domestic or foreign policy issues, education, health care, what have you. We have to make those kinds of, kinds of decisions and we have to be able to impact the direction into which you know, they go. Yes. Excuse me, Dr. Palani. What has been the response of Jesse Jackson to your campaign? Mm -hmm. And does he feel that your campaign is going to have either a negative or a positive mm -hmm. um, Jesse has been very, very quiet. <laughs> uh, I happen to know that he's gotten you know, a lot of pressure from a host of sources to come out and make a statement on it, but he hasn't. In February, I guess, of 87, um, when I had an opportunity to speak with him about this and the Two Roads plan, uh, basically what he said was that independent politics was prophetic, not pathetic, prophetic. <laughs> uh, however, that the black community, if you will, was not quite ready for them or it. Uh, obviously, I disagree with Reverend Jackson on that very point. Um, what Jesse has said relative to the uh, Democratic Party nomination is that he is going to support whoever the Democratic Party nominee is. That's the oath that he's taken. Um, and I think that he should go as far as he feels he has to go, and he should support that nominee. I guess who I'm most concerned about um, are the millions of people who are Jackson supporters, who are believers and builders in the rainbow movement. I want to know where they're going to go. And that's who I'm going to be outside of the convention organizing. <laughs> that's who I've been speaking to for many, many, many years. Um, I think Jesse has the right to run his campaign in the way that he wants to. And we have to have the right to make sure that we, the people, are able to gain off of what we've built through him. Yes? I wonder if you could uh, share with us some of your professional and your um, political background. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, I am traditionally trained as a developmental psychologist. Um, I direct gr a grouping of independent uh, community medical and mental health clinics in the New York City area, six of them, actually. I became a psychologist primarily because um, I thought that psychology was a way to help treat some of the pain and humiliation and the disempowerment of black people, other people of color, and poor people. Uh, I, at the age of 12, watched my father dying in bed in Chester, Pennsylvania because an ambulance service would not come into the black community and pick him up. And I think that was my first overt taste of American injustice. I didn't know enough then to call it racism, but I knew there was something <laughs> off about it. And I was determined, even as a young, young kid, to do something about that kind of thing in this country. So that took me to, to psychology. Um, I, it took me into political activism, uh, and it has currently taken me into running for an independent candidate for President of the United States. I've been a strong supporter and builder of um, fights for civil rights uh, in self-determination movements. Uh, for women's rights, for gay and lesbian rights, and currently for electoral rights for the American people. And I guess what I'm raising relative to the White House is that I think that the nature of the presidency of this country must change. Up until this point, the only people who seem to be the right material are upper class, wealthy white men. And they don't particularly represent the majority of white folks, <laughs> let alone most other peoples in this country. I don't particularly like that kind of material because I don't think you can convert that material into a people's leader, into a people, people's candidate. And what I think we need are leaders in this country who are willing to lead the country in a direction that, again, is much more supportive of the majority of American people. Other questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, again, uh, respectively, uh, uh, what do you think that uh, we as uh, a state or a nation can do about homeless people? You know, I hear so much about this in the, in the media. Mm -hmm. You know, do you think this situation should exist? Don't you think that we have enough money 
uh, to take care of our own. I mean, black, white, Hispanic, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I don't. I, I personally, I don't feel that there uh, should be any persons that that we cannot pro provide for. Mm -hmm. You know, with some decent shelter mm -hmm. and food. I agree, one hundred percent. And bigger than my agreement, <laughs> something like 68% of the American people um, who participated in a poll also agree that we should have federal subsidized housing mm -hmm. to guarantee that no one in this country ever lives on the streets. Uh, I've been and will continue to lobby for a constitutional amendment that makes the right to housing um, basically a right and not a privilege uh, by virtue of it being uh, provided through the Constitution. Um, I think what we need to look at in this case um, is this gap again between the fact that obviously the majority of American people support the right to housing for everybody and nevertheless we're living in a situation where millions of people are living on the streets and in a way the Democrats and Republicans no politician would ever get up and say I don't support the right to housing for anybody because they realize that that would be an absurd statement but in fact Democrats and Republicans alike um, they raise big monies off of, they profiteer off of uh, the lack of housing in this country. In the Harlem community, and this is happening all around this nation, there's been a tremendous amount of gentrification. That gentrification was allowed to happen by um, the Charlie Wrangles and the other politicians in that area, including Ed Koch, who did not speak out when people were finally leaving homes that were owned by the city in Harlem because their, the upkeep was just